Everyone, it's Ross, and uh, in today's video, we're going to be looking at an orchard map and kind of how to set this up, um, where everything is going to go in my yard. But we've already talked about this in a prior video. I showed you guys actually out in the yard. You can go back and watch that and really get a visual for that. But I actually think it's a little bit easier to explain when it's laid out sort of like this. Um, obviously, nothing has a label on it, but you can kind of really understand what I'm what I'm trying to accomplish um, by looking at it like this. I mean, this is my house right here. Um, and then these are all different individual things that have fruit trees in them. So we'll get into that in a second, but uh, Google Draw is the name of the program, I guess, I'm using to create this. It's pretty simple. You know, you just get a shape here, square, a circle, how, whatever it is you want to do, you can also put in, you know, let's say other shapes into this, right? So you got a circle there, and you can then label that as a particular variety or number that as a particular variety and have a key. Um, I've seen people do that. You know, you can really get pretty detailed with this and have this as a nice little thing, and I think it's pretty uh, important. And. The whole reason I think it's important is that you can kind of map this out um, in a spreadsheet. And that's also what I've done. If you guys go into my spreadsheet, you can see all that laid out there. Um, but this really makes it more easier to work with, right? If I want to move something around, it's really simple, right? Instead of having figs in this location, I can just change this to something else and, you know, voila, right? So I, I just think it's a lot easier and it's a lot easier to work with and I just suggest you guys do this like planning is extremely important when it comes to an orchard when it comes to you know even a garden planning is so so important so I highly recommend it and I highly um, recommend you guys try this if anyone has any like other resource or something that they use I'd love to hear about it maybe it's just as easy as this be pretty cool you know um, but let's get into it here so this is where the the house is and then if you guys are coming out of my back porch this is the back porch right here and then to the to the side of that is the garden bed this is my main garden bed this is also where I have some fig trees planted in the ground that's in a really nice spot like the the best microclimate I can give them um, now below this, in this location here, in these two little spots, that's where we overwinter our trees. Um, we just leave them outside. All the potted trees that can withstand that cold, we leave them outside all winter. We cover them with straw. We did videos on that, right? And go back and watch that. These, we're all moving them out of here, right? We're moving them out of this location and we're gonna put a lot of them in the ground. So this kind of frees up this location and I figured, you know what, why not use that space? Let's do something with it. And we're going to put in um, two rows of figs and five figs per row. And there are every, every fig tree that I'm going to mention in this video is going to be four feet apart, four feet in the row and four feet apart between trees in the row. So pretty close, but, um, you know, I think it, uh, I think it'll work out and at some point I'm going to thin them out and change around different varieties. I'm not going to keep certain varieties in the ground. It's, it's, um, I think some of them are a bit of an experiment and we'll see which ones end up working out the best. Out here in the front we have a, a, a row of figs that uh, is really out in the open and this is the least, it's probably the worst spot I have for them but you know they're there and they're existing and they're actually doing pretty decently so I'm gonna leave them here and I'm also gonna add in two additional varieties this year um, I think we're gonna plan out an Azores dark there and a blue Celeste if I'm not mistaken they should be very hardy varieties and that's exactly why I'm putting them there um, here's the peaches the yellow peaches here and then we have grape vines that come across and then behind the fence here along the fence is a new uh, couple grapevines we're going to put in. These are going to be muscadine grapes, Triumph and Lane. 
And then back in here, spy eight against the fence, just like our peaches are a spy eight against the fence. Using all these wires, it really has been uh, incredible. Um, I really like using wires. I like having these things in hedges and in tiers and on terraces, and I think it's a great way of doing this. Um, these are going to be two Aspiyad plums, and these are going to be in a two-tier system, whereas the peaches are in a three-tier system. These will be two. Um, and then this here is the kiwi vine that we put in this year with a whole bunch of different you know shrubs below it. And then this is what we did really only not too long ago. We planted out all these dwarf apple trees. We did a video on that, guys, if you want to see kind of how that was done and why I did it this way. But the dwarf apple trees really are going to cover, you know, this whole area. And I have two rows of them, two hedges. In between the hedge is six feet, and in between each tree is two feet. And in each hole is two trees. So for a total of 20 trees, 20 dwarf apple trees in two rows here should be uh, a productive little corner that i have them in this little purple area i'm not exactly sure maybe this is more pink right this is um kind of that area that is a bit open right now i'm open to anything um you know i i like the fact that i i have mulberries and i want to put some mulberries in there right I have some Girardi Dwarf Mulberries that aren't going to get too big. They don't need to be in full sun. This is a pretty good location for that. Um, you know, And the Dwarf Mulberries only get 6 feet by 6 feet. I could fit two of them in that location real easy. Um, but I may want to put some other things in there like, you know, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we're kind of seeing how all this stuff works out. But there's some other things I may want to put in there like gooseberries and or honeyberries or just other kind of shrub like things to kind of fill in that area you know nothing too extreme maybe some saskatoons or service berries that kind of thing um, but that kind of concludes this whole area even this whole area here let's get around to this because this is where most of the action I think is gonna happen in my yard um, or a lot of the changes so Along the west side of the house, this is the this is the west side of the house. This is south here, um, and this is west. So then, this little section here was not really filled in with anything. This is just a, a strip of rocks, and we have some uh, air conditioner units there along the house. Um, but this is a perfect spot, guys, for figs. Other than this little area here that I have dedicated for the figs, and this little area here. These two spots get the most amount of sunlight in my yard. So this area here and this area here is like full sun almost all day. This section isn't exactly full sun, but it's a strong, warm. The color temperature of the sun really helps with fruiting. Uh, this is the perfect place, I think, for some fig trees. They're going to get a lot of heat this way. They're against the house. This is probably prime location number two for figs and as we go out we're getting more rows of figs this will be 10 10 fig trees in the ground here again four feet apart this will be seven fig trees in the ground and this will be seven as well so um the fact that we have all these new fig trees we have roughly around i think it's 35 fig trees that i'm going to put in the ground this this year this spring different varieties things that i'm really excited for others i'm kind of just putting in the ground to have access to more wood that way i can propagate very easily from them um, and these two spaces here are going to be two asian persimmons we'll have a probably the seijo persimmon and maybe guang yang or um, i think the other one i have is great wall that i need to move around the third persimmon will be in this location so of those three varieties i just mentioned they'll be in these areas here where it's orange we already have the rosianca persimmon already existing there um and this location here is where my apple trees already were we had three dwarf apple trees in the ground here that we moved over here a couple weeks ago but this little area is going to be for eight peach varieties and nectarines there's going to be i think it's like two or three nectarines and the rest of that is going to be peaches all on standard rootstock and they're going to be grown in hedges similar to this except that they'll all be one hedge um 
just like my apple tree is how I have two trees in one hole, if you can imagine that this is one tree and this is another tree, right? This is four trees, I should say, and this is four trees, but they're all in the same hole. And then that way they branch out across away from each other and they form a nice little hedge that way. And the orientation I've particularly selected here so that um, the center of the trees, the sunlight can directly go through the center of those trees. And this little area here, this section in particular, was where we had a raised bed. And in this raised bed is raspberries and blackberries. We're going to knock down the sides of that raised bed, use all that excess soil, and create two mounds for the figs. And by using those two mounds, we're going to have a lot of thermal mass that way. And we're going to be able to kind of build up the soil more and plant the fig trees a little bit higher off the ground. Really increase their metabolisms uh, much faster and get them going much earlier in the season. This area here where the persimmons are going to go, I have small grafted persimmons that I grafted last year. This is where the Illinois Everbearing Mulberry was. And we're going to chop that down, I think, all the way to the base and really try to kill it. It's going to be very difficult, but I think over the years we'll probably succeed. Um, I can drill some holes in the, in the trunk there and really get the thing um, as close to dead as humanly possible. And it really sucks because I like Illinois Everbearing. It's an incredible tree. I put a lot of fertilizer and a lot of time into that tree, right? Lots of soil has been built up in that location, but it's just not going to work out for me. Um, it's just too big of a tree. It's too close to the house. Um, I much prefer to have the Girardi variety, unless, of course, I moved out and had my own property and could put these things wherever I wanted. I had a lot of land. Otherwise, it's just not a great, you know, idea. The birds get most of the fruit. You know, maybe I could put a mulberry in this corner of the yard, but I think that would block out a lot of the sunlight. But once we knock down this raised bed and, you know, have all that soil that's then pushed away and moved into other locations and creating those two berms, you know, then it's like, okay, well, what am I going to do with the raspberries and blackberries that already exist here? Because they are extremely fruitful, very productive, nothing bothers them. The one of the easiest things you can grow here. Well, I'm just going to move them down here in these two rows here, these, this red row. And I know that's confusing because it's like apples are the color red, but the raspberries and blackberries will get their own little thing. We're going to have, um, I believe it's two Caroline raspberries, which are red, the red raspberries. We're going to have one pink raspberry, double gold. It's called, we're going to have two yellow, I think, or maybe one yellow which is Anne, and we're going to have two purple raspberries called Royalty, I believe is their name, and that's going to be six raspberry varieties in there, um, and the idea is to have multiple colors because the color directly translates to flavor. They will be different tasting raspberries. They already have. Between the pink ones and the red ones, it's very different, um, and then the other part of this bed because six raspberry Six raspberries only take up a, uh, a four foot by six foot space, right? A 10, you know, 10 square, what is that? 24 square feet? Oh boy, okay. The point is anyway, the, the rest of this bed, which is more than 24 square feet, um, I'm gonna be putting in a lot of blackberries. We're gonna have two of the Primark Freedoms that we have already in this bed. We're gonna move them over here. And then we're gonna add in a new blackberry this year that fruits on um, flora canes, which is that second year wood, those second year old canes. And then that way we're gonna get that real early in the season. And um, you know, it's just gonna be better that way. Um, it completely avoids SWD. I have canes that will, you know, avoid the, um, or I have canes that will fruit early in the season. I have uh, canes that will fruit late in the season with the Primark Freedoms. Um, sorry guys, I, I smell a little smoke upstairs, so I'm wondering what's going on, but, um, this section here is going to be pears. We're going to have two rows of pears, similar to these peaches here, how it's going to be two rows of pears, but they're going to be in the same hole. So it's really only one row, but I'm doing that to kind of differentiate the fact that there's going to be some varieties growing out this way and some varieties growing out the other way. You know what I mean? 
So those are going to be Asian pears and European pears, and they're on semi-dwarf rootstock. They should get somewhere around 18 feet max if I let them, but they should be, they're pretty vigorous trees, and um, that's why I'm doing this, is that I want as vigorous as I can trees in the ground. You know, these dwarf trees, we really pack them in close. These pears, I probably am going to give them more space than I should, but um, this row here is going to be eight plum trees. Actually, six plums and two apricots, I believe. So, um, and these all, sim they grow similarly, right? I'm going to put the pears together. I'm going to put the uh, plums and the, and the apricots together because they grow similar. Oh, and there's also pluots in there. You know, they're not all plums, right? And the same thing with the peaches and nectarines. They all grow very, very similar. So put put them together, right? Make sure they're all on the same rootstock. But this is going to be a similar thing where, right, there's multiple trees in the same hole two feet away from each other, and they're going to span, you know, eight feet, right? It's going to be an eight-foot row, two feet in between each hole with two trees in each hole, and they'll give them, you know, the appropriate room by having one scaffold go out in one direction again, one scaffold going out in the other direction. So, altogether, these plums and apricots can deal with uh, less sun. So can the raspberries and blackberries. So can the persimmon, and so can the the pears. Believe it or not, they can deal with six to seven hours of sun. Whereas something like peaches, as an example, I have them in full sun because I think they need that sun more than these other varieties right the cherries i think need that as well maybe even some disease um not as disease resistant trees like the apricots i'm kind of risking a little bit but i'm going to put them in the front where they're getting more exposure from the sun i want them to dry quicker in the day earlier in the day right i want that morning sun to kind of dry off those leaves if it rained at night right dry off the trees dry off the fruit prevent that rot um, that's extremely important, and it's often overlooked. So I want to point that out, but we are risking it a little bit by doing this because this is the afternoon sun, right? They're not going to get that morning sun at all. They're only going to get it from midday onwards until the sun sets. So, um, you know, it's a bit of a risk, but I would much prefer, I think, to have the, you know, the uh, the peaches in this location here where they're getting more sun. Um these things, I don't really want them to wake up as early, right? So put them in a colder spot in your yard that doesn't get as much sunlight. The soil doesn't warm up as quickly. Um, I would rather have things like plums and apricots wake up much later. Um, well, they're naturally going to wake up earlier than the peaches, but uh, you know, putting them in a colder spot is certainly going to help delay that by a couple days, maybe a couple weeks if you're lucky. So... It's all about site selection here, and you know this is all about correcting past mistakes. None of this is perfect, but this is what I'm working with. I'd rather have the fig trees in this location here and put these things that don't need as much sunlight or don't need as much heat, put them in this location, because this location radiates that heat, this thermal mass from the house, thermal mass from the rocks, thermal mass from the berms. You know, this is a really warm location compared to this one, believe it or not. Um, even though it's really only probably 20 feet in between these two two things here. Um, so that's pretty much the video, guys. I really just wanted to show you that this is possible to do this on Google Draw and that you should do this. It's important. Um, it really helps and it's easy to work with. And I also wanted to show you guys the, the future plans of the orchard and what's going to happen come spring. We're going to have a lot of things that are going to be moved around, like I said. A lot of things I'm going to put in the ground. I mean, you know, all together, what is this? Eight trees here, three persimmons, six pears, eight plums, you know, six raspberries, uh, probably somewhere around 10 blackberries, 35 fig varieties, two malt, two, uh, two muscadine grapes, um, and two mulberry trees. I mean, that's... That's a lot to plant in the ground in one season, guys. <laughs> so I'll definitely get some videos on like, you know, planting them, why I planted them there, you know, how to plant them, all that kind of thing. So anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this one and, you know, 
I suggest you guys follow me on Facebook, you know. Um, we're really posting a lot of things over there on other forms of social media. I know I say this pretty often, but I don't think I say it enough, you know. Subscribe to the channel. You know, support. You guys can support me on Patreon. Um, you can follow me here on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I also have a new website that I just put out, rossratty.weebly.com. And, um, you know, this is going to be perfect for people that like to read this kind of thing uh, on social media, but that's more of a longer form, like a blog, right? Um, you get more information this way. There's no limits on what I can say, right? Instagram and Twitter are not preventing me from writing only a couple sentences. You know, this is more valuable information, I think, for people. And, um, yeah, just check all this stuff out, guys. It's all in the, in the description of this video. I'll try to put the uh, link to Google Draw in the description as well. That way you guys will have it. And uh, I'll catch you all later. All right? Take care, guys.